Okay, perfect. Thank you everybody for, for joining me today. Um, I wanna talk about something that I've been struggling with in my 15 years as a developer on the web, and that's um, getting paid. Uh, about 20 years ago, I learned how to create websites. I kind of made them for anything and everything. Um, my first website was made on this little service called GeoCities, um, and that's where hosting used to happen. After I got decent at it, I started looking for ways I could make a little bit of money from them. Some of the websites I was making even back then were quite useful. Uh, now, because I lived back then, I lived in a in a country that banks uh, used to classify as a shit country. And I couldn't actually get a bank account or getting paid by a lot of people. PayPal didn't work in Romania for a really long time. My only option was to try and put ads on them. And that, I'm not gonna go into the ethics of putting ads on your website, um, but spoiler alert, I didn't put ads on my website. And back then banner ads and pop-up ads were all, all the rage. It was just, pay-per-click was just emerging. You weren't, ads weren't really smart. Actually a fun fact, Pop-up ads are the reason why all your all your browsers right now ship with a pop-up blocker by default, and pop-ups are blocked by default. Um, back back then, targeted ads weren't a thing. You, you used to go on a website, and a website popped up on another website, trying to get you off of it. Uh, fast forward twenty years, right? You got ad networks now, which are kind of, so, they're so consolidated and expanded. Um, two of the ad networks account for 70% of the ads you see, or 70% of the ads people, people see. Uh, it's, they've become a lot better at showing you what you don't really want to see or what you don't need to see right now. Tracking evolved to the point ads can be considered smart. Um, I, on the other hand, I'm not as smart as I used to be. Aging does that. You mute yourself, Alex. Uh, right. w was I talking alone? No, now it's working. Okay, so I was, I was saying, uh, I've tried setting up today's to see setting up ads today to see how that to see how that how that looks like, um, and I've had to follow instructions right. I googled how to set up set up ads, and I went to the uh, the most popular way to do ads, the Google AdSense, right. And uh, if you go on the website, the first thing you see is. I thought I needed to get an account first, right? I, I thought I needed to set up for Google, to sign up for Google AdSense. That's not the first step they tell you. The first step they tell you is build the right kind of website and then get an account. What does that actually mean? Why, why is the right type of website more important than getting an account today? And before you, before you jump to any kind of conclusions, I wasn't trying to put ads on, the wrong kind of websites. I'm trying to put ads on puns.dev, right? It's a curated selection of the worst computer puns on the internet. AdSense didn't have problem with the, with the content I was having, but the topic wasn't generating enough buzz um, as, as they, they, they want. So turns out if you want to make money with ads today, you have to build for traffic and not necessarily for people or for usefulness, um, or for a niche, or for yourself. With limited tra traffic, ads don't usually pay out. Um, what if your website has a small or very loyal following, right? Pounds.dev, for example, we have a thousand people a day, but the average session on the website is 15 minutes. It's not a lot of people, but they're highly engaged by the content. They stay on the website quite a while. Um, if I had the right type of content, probably that would be okay for AdSense, even with those numbers. Or if I had 100 times more sessions um, connecting. T 
time on page was not relevant at all. And it's not really relevant for ads because if you try to think about it, ads are designed to capture attention and move you away from your content, from your website as fast as possible and into a sales process of some kind. So you're basically only making money when you, you have a shitty website and people will get off of, of it as soon as possible. You don't make any money with ads while people stay on the website. It's uh, really an incentive to build for SEO and short content rather than for people. And uh, if you happen to have the type of content, con content or traffic that's marketable, then you're spoiled for choice for ads. And you can have any ads, you, any, as, as many ads as you want. If you take a look at any of the news websites out there, you'll see they had a really tough choice picking just one ad. And they kind of put ad everywhere on page. Um, I'm joking. They, they probably want the user experience to be so bad that you'll stop reading the news and you'll go get yourself something pretty. But it, you see how the user experience degenerates once the incentive becomes, in, becomes to get you off of the website because they have all that traffic and content. Yeah, while researching for my talk, I have to admit, I ran into one of these news websites. I saw so many ads and I bought myself something pretty. I'm not very proud of it. Uh, but that's it. Ads are just that smart today. It's just they're not built for creators. Um, you, might, you might say, how, how did you get to see ads on the internet today? I actually have two levels of ad blocking. I'm a developer, or I used to be a developer in a different lifetime, and I've got ad blockers. I've actually got two levels of ad blockers. So I have one in my browser, but I also have one that's running on my router, and that's stopping all the URLs that look like ads or all the popular ad network URLs from actually loading. And even with two levels of ad blocking, I do see ads. I do see the occasional ads or I have ads that are way just too smart for the tech. There's always gonna be a race between the people who have an ad network or who run an ad network and the ad blockers. Um, what about me, the website maker? In, if I have a low traffic website or a niche website, even the, the, the few ads that I can have on my website, they, they're getting blocked. So I'm not making a lot of money with my website, right? It's not really exactly growing my bank account. And that's why a couple of years ago, I stumbled upon something called the Web Monetization API. It was an emerging web, web API that seemed more geared, geared towards rewarding me for people spending more time on my website, not less. So um, if you go on the webmonetization.org website, it says it's a JavaScript browser API that allows the creation of a payment stream from the user agent to the website. I know, I was really confused about it as well. It doesn't sound very user-friendly. Uh, the creation of a payment stream from the user agent to the website. It actually translates in, your websites can get paid from the browser. So the browser pays websites on your behalf without you having to worry about payment or without you having to remember that you should tip your waiters on the way up, right? Um, and as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to ads, it's not from the seller that pays an ad network that eventually pays you for bringing people to a product. With web monetization, your, your website is the product. And you're being paid by your users who usually pay a web organization provider and they you get paid on behalf of your users the the current web organization provider is called coil and it's attention based so you're getting paid about 36 cents an hour for um every other second for the users on your website so me when i visit the website today Coil actually pays on my behalf at the rate of 36 cents an hour every second. Uh, my users that are web monetized, they pay me at the, sim at the same rate, All right? So that's how I feel like since November, since November last year, I think I made 30 pounds with this. It's not a lot of money, but considering that I couldn't even put ads on my websites or the, the, the amount of ads I could made absolutely no money to speak of, I feel like this is a better alternative. And that's because my, my content was targeted towards people staying, not people leaving my website. 
Um, the motivation behind the creation of this API was simple. Um, you couldn't really transfer money on the web. You could have a web page that told you all the details about it. You could have a, an input field to collect card details, but you couldn't actually use the browser to pay anyone. So you can see the web suffers from a, a, a flood of ads or some or, or corrupt business models, to be honest. Uh, and I liked webinization because it provided an open, native, and efficient way to to compensate the, the, the people I was visiting, right? The websites I was visiting. Um, I, was, I was basically supporting crucial web infrastructure. Now, I wouldn't go as far as saying pass.dev is crucial, crucial web infrastructure, but it certainly fits as a creation. So I like the idea of being rewarded for my creation in an ethical way. Uh, and as a developer on the open web, that was the, the main reason I tried web annotation when I passed up on ads more than a decade ago. And this can be like adding web annotation to my website was actually as easy as, as putting down one single line of HTML. I had to add a meta tag to a web page, and the meta tag name was monetization, and I had to give it something called a payment pointer. And as soon as I had that, people who were who had the webization provider started paying automatically. You might wonder what a payment pointer is in this whole equation, because meta tags, we've been using those on the web for a while. It's, um, it's actually a standard that's supposed to be an identifier for payment accounts. So in the same way, I have an email address and it provides me, like it has an identifier for where, where my email lives, like for the mailbox in, in the ecosystem. A payment pointer is used in the same way to share details of my accounts. So instead of having to give people my email, I give people my payment pointer. Um, to get your payment pointer, you have a few. You have a few options. There are a few wallets that give you payment pointers with your account. So there's two that work uh, around the world uh, called Uphold and GitHub. There's actually a few more being added in um, as part of this process. But after you have a payment pointer, you put it on the you put it on the page in the meta element, and that's it. Where I'm in, in, in between, I found about webinization API, and I got excited about it. I actually got really curious and wanted to see how I can make this better. So I'm now part of the W3C group that works on webinization on the web or on the webinization specification. And we're in the process of updating the specification, creating a new version for it. And in the new version, we're switching from the meta tag to a link tag. We figured out the browsers already have a way to access a URL via a link tag, same way you're doing CSS, for example. So we're switching from meta tags to link tags. Both of them are gonna be supported for the foreseeable future. But if you want to safeguard for the future, I'd say put both in your website today. The difference is the link tag doesn't have the, uh, the payment pointer shorthand notation, the dollar sign. It has the full URL to the payment pointer. So dollar, dollar wallet.example.com slash Alex actually translates in HTTPS wallet.example.com Alex. So putting both in your website right now, you kind of safeguarding for the future. I don't have a launch date for the W3C spec. We've been working on it for the past year and a half, probably. But if you've worked with the W3C, you'll know just how slow things move there. Um, if I'm being realistic, I'd say towards the end of the year, probably we're going to make the switch. But we're, right now, we're in open console consultation. And if you have feedback, you should go on GitHub and tell us all about it. Um, I also said earlier that webinization was a JavaScript API. The meta link is what I did on my website because I'm really lazy and because I like this to be a value plus, a sort of a donation-like feature. So you can see my content no matter what. If you happen to be web monetized, I will happily accept your streaming money while you watch my website but I don't want to gate my content or hide my content behind a paywall or do anything more complicated that, than saying thank you for the, 
for the process. If you want to do more complicated stuff with webization, there's actually a corresponding JavaScript API that lets you know when monetization has started on the page, when it stopped, or what the browser is actually trying to, to get you paid. And you can do this you can do this to do things like unlock extra content or um, just basically show messages to your users for, for, for the privilege. Uh, because we're, we're in the process of updating the specification, the uh, monetization API is going to change a little bit in, in the coming year. It's going to change to be, instead of the document, it's going to be on the link. So you'll be able to... Um, you'll be able to have more granular control on which exactly of your payment pointers is receiving money. As I was saying, uh, we're, we're developing this as the W3C as a standard uh, in the web platform incubator community group. This is your chance to contribute to its future. We've got a lot of issues open for discussion right now. We're actually looking for community feedback, actively looking for community feedback before we finish incubating this into the next step in the standard track. If you head over to github.com slash WICG slash uh, we'd love to hear from you. In terms of adoption, browser, browsers already have support for the webinization standard either natively or via an extension. Puma browser, for example, is a mobile browser that implements this natively. Um, webinization natively, and there's an extension for all the major desktop browser. It's actually an open source extension, so if you see something you don't like while you use it, you can you can actually help us fix it. In the past, in the past year, uh, at the end of last year, actually, we did uh, we did something called the Web Almanac. Actually, there is a project called the Web Almanac, and I was part of it last year. But as part of the the Web Almanac. We looked at a little over 8 million websites uh, to come up with like a state of the web report. And as part of the markup chapter, we've looked at how many of those websites were web monetized. We've seen adoption steadily growing over the past year, which is great considering how big the HTTP archive is and how slowly it takes to gain numbers, even for a feature that's widely and natively supported. We're running the query. So this query, the, the query in here was run in July last year. We're actually rerunning the query and we're working on the Web Almanac 2022 this month. I'm really curious to see how those numbers have changed since uh, October last year up until this month. And I'll, uh, I'll share the results as soon as the, the query start, finished running at the end of June on my, on my Twitter account. You should, um, if you're into this, you should follow me. You might wonder why haven't, hasn't webinization happened sooner? It's a very good question. And that's because until re recently, you couldn't really get paid or transfer money on the internet with those amounts, with those values. Um, there's a new protocol that kind of enables simple payments uh, that are currency ag agnostic and that has the capability to do very small quantities of money. Uh, and because it has this capability to do even very small quantities of money or very small amounts of money, it opens up the, the possibility for streaming money for the first time. And it makes web monetization possible. Before we dig deeper into this, this new protocol, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the, the problems that it actually solves. If we think about it today, there's a lot of places where you have money stored. Let's call them ledgers. And no, it doesn't mean ledgers as in what you imagine crypto to be. Before crypto, ledgers used to be a book of accounts that holds transactions. So if, if by that definition, uh, your bank account is a ledger, or PayPal is a ledger, or Venmo is a ledger, or you know banks, most of the banks. Uh, but even Starbucks is a ledger. If you think about you, Starbucks, it gives you an account, it lets you pay with your account, and it records all of your transactions. So if you want to move money between these places today, uh, you, don't, you don't have that many options. So for example, if I want to move money from my bank account to somebody else with a bank account in the same bank, I've chose, if you're not from the UK, 
Um, you probably haven't heard about Metro Bank. In the UK, Metro Bank is the shittiest bank available right now. But if you want to pay somebody within the same account system, it's easy and cheap. They don't charge any fees and you have the similar, uh, similar looking account and the money arrives instantly because of the same bank. The money never actually leaves the bank, just one and zero changes in the database and you get paid. If you want to do this bank, a bank transfer between a bank in the UK and the bank in the US, um, it stops being easy. It's cheap because UK banks and US banks have a relationship. So they have a trust relationship. So my money actually doesn't get to the US bank, but the US bank will loan you the same amount of money that I, I'm trying to send you and you get money instantly, but the money gets sent actually three days later. Um, and in the meantime, you're trading on credit. If something happens with the transfer in the process, they, they take their money back and they don't really care. If I try to do the same bank transfer between my bank in the UK and my mom's shitty bank in Romania, it's not cheap either. Because these two banks don't have a relationship, um, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to do the, the the transfer. So we have to find out um, similar account system that works for both of us. It's usually called in Europe. It's usually IBAN. So we have to find an IBAN bank account for our accounts, and then we have to find a bank in between the two banks that will accept my money and forward it to the other bank. Because of the, the complexities of the process, it can take between three and seven days for the money to arrive. And I can lose up to 18% of it in fees, depending on how many banks get involved, how shitty my bank is, how shitty my mom's bank is. And like this is within the same continent. If I'm trying to do something with Africa, for example, good luck with that. I have, to find a, I have to find a US bank account in between or the money goes to the US first and then from US to Africa. And it's kind of complicated. If I'm trying to do this from my Starbucks account, it becomes impossible. It just becomes impossible. Even though I have money in my, in my Starbucks account and there is a Starbucks Romania entity, those entities don't really talk to each other, let alone my Starbucks account in the UK to transfer money to my mom's, mom's bank account in Romania. And that's because those two ledgers, they don't normally talk to each other. And this whole process I've just described also becomes impossible if I'm trying to transfer or transact a very small amount of money. My bank, for example, has a minimum of 10 pounds. If I'm trying to send a dollar, halfway around the world, I can't on the banking system. I can on the card network. If I'm trying to pay a dollar, I could try to pay a dollar on the card network. But the problem with the card network is Visa and MasterCard, they have a minimum fee. So they take a 30 cents plus 2.75% fee. So if I, send, if I pay somebody a dollar, they get 60 something cents back. It's not really cost effective to lose 30 something percent of your, of your money, right? If I try to send less, think about web monetization. We're talking about fractions of a cent being sent every second. That becomes absolutely impossible. Uh, the, the technology to, to do this, and that's why web monetization was a concept. Everybody thought about these microtransactions. Um, they're not a novel idea, but until recently, the, the technology for doing this wasn't developed. And that's why the Interledger Foundation has developed something called Interledger, which is literally a protocol, a bunch of words on a piece of paper designed to solve these type of problems. It's an open and neutral protocol for transferring money, very, very small amounts of money at the time. And that's because it was, it was modeled after the internet. Actually, it was modeled after the TCP IP protocol. So in the same way, the TCP IP protocol powers a network called the internet. <laughs> the Interledger protocol powers a network called Interledger. And it's based, it's mapped almost one-to-one, -one, uh, almost one-to-one -one on TCP IP. The main difference is in TCP IP, if you lose a packet of data, nobody gets upset. You can resend the same packet of data over and over again until you receive it at the other end. 
on the IntelliJ with the IntelliJ protocol, if you lose a packet of money, people tend <laughs> tend to get upset. So there is no way to actually lose a pack a packet of money in the network. If the packet never reaches the destination or never gets fulfilled at the end, it gets rolled back, rolled back. But it's it was designed to 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 let you add payments or to make payments without having to worry about things like what's your currency or what's your payment provider. Uh, it's designed to send money from one ledger to the other, from one system to the other, even if the systems aren't connected or if the way they represent money internally is different. If you think about my bank, my bank is probably running on Fortran on software that was written 40 years ago. It most definitely does not store money in the same way my digital wallet stores money, which is basically a MongoDB database. And at the end of the day, they don't talk to each other. It was created in 2015 by uh, Stefan Thomas and Evan Schwartz. They put out a white paper called an Interledger Protocol, and then they released the first implementation. Uh, since then, the protocol stack has evolved considerably. It's now at version four. Uh, and it's very simplified from the original design. It's actually optimized for very large volumes of very low value packets. The term is called penny switching, but if you think about the internet, the internet is very good at taking uh, a huge amount of data. For example, I'm this talk right now is in 4K. My camera outputs 4K, but the internet is really good at taking that 4K video packetizing it in a million little packets and sending it via so many different routes to get to the same destination. It doesn't have to use the same route for every packet or the same route for the entire file. It uses probably six or seven different routes to send this file to its destination, this massive file. And the IntelliJ network works in a similar fashion. The same way the TCP IP protocol has four layers, application, transport, internetwork, and link. The IntelliJ protocol follows the same, the same layers. The only difference is the link layer in TCP IP links into a different network. The link layer in IntelliJ links into different ledgers. So it's a mechanism to, to connect ledgers together. We have comparable, comparable layers. Um, they're called SPSP for the application layer. And that's where payment pointers come in. SPSP is the lever that gives you payment pointers. So all the information in SPSP, you can actually see in that, it's called simple payment setup protocol. And that's what payment pay pointer is, that URL you get. Uh, it uses streaming or the stream protocol for transport. And that's basically in charge of taking, taking what you think is money and packetizing it or, or transferring that packet of money. The actual packet of money is the interledger layer, and that's an octet-based octet -based package that's on ASN1 and basically codifies what money, money is. Um, the BTP layer is the thing that, that, it's called the bilateral transport protocol, and it's the thing that communicates the information over WebSocket, and it, it feeds into all the different ledgers we support right now, around all the different ledgers where money are stored. It's very similar to the banking system. The banking system is, has a messaging layer at the top. Uh, the clearing layer is in the middle, but the problem is um, you've probably noticed the settlement layer and that's the, prop, the part that banks, that's where banks fail in 2022. The settlement layer, the settlement can take up to seven days and that's where your fee is coming from. And because we don't put the settlement layer in the network, it actually means all those ledgers, instead of having to settle for every transaction, they can settle off the network independently without having to worry about it. And that means the network is instant, but the settlement can be deferred. So Interledger was designed to exchange value between all these different ledgers. And one of the side effects of the initial design was this ability to exchange any value, including extremely small values. Something the current banking um, system can't really do. It's the whole reason why webinization is possible today. If you'd like to get involved in either webinization or IntelliJ as a whole, we at the IntelliJ Foundation, uh, we have monthly community calls um, or we have a Slack instance where you can come chat with us. 
You can learn more about what we do at the IntelliJ Foundation. I'm the technology lead at the IntelliJ Foundation. Um, and you can find me either in Slack or through one of the forms on the on the website. We also have a community for web monetization where a bunch of the people who are experimenting with web monetization are today. It's community.webmonetization.org. If you're really trying to see how this works, you can see a lot of people sharing their, not only their strategies for web monetizing their assets, but the outcomes that happen after you web monetize your assets. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you. If you want to try out web monetization for yourself, um, I actually have a bunch of coupon codes for one of the web monetization providers. So it gives you six months free. So you can start paying websites. Um, you can basically start paying websites on the internet out of my, or the very generous pocket of Coil. If you reach out on Twitter after this talk, I can send you the uh, the coupon code, their individual coupon code. So I can send you a coupon code to give it a try and see how paying for websites on the internet or saying thank you on the internet to random websites um, makes you feel. And with that, I'd like to thank you. If you've had questions, uh, we're gonna look at chat right now. I feel there hasn't been any uh, question. Guillermo has a question. Guillermo, go ahead. Yes. Hello, how are you? Uh, I, I hope you can see me now. Um, the, I only understand the way to pay like a stream. Is there a way, any other way to pay? Because I, I'm in, in if the only one is the stream, like I'm, I'm spending two hours in your website, so it, you receive that payment. Um, how that is clear for the for the user, right? So if I enter to any website that have this web monetization, do they have to sign it in, in any other way that I am spending money reading on that website? Or so should the, I um, click a button? Okay, so that's a very good question. So this is all the, the, the standard, the HTML standard, the web monetization standard, doesn't assume all of these things. It just makes it possible so your browser picks up the payment point of your page and looks in your configuration and says, do you have a weaponization provider you have? What's the rate at which to pay? And it starts paying. But the extension actually has a visual indicator that says you are paying this website. Thank you for your, for your payments. Um, Coil, for example, one of the, the weaponization providers actually has a different way to pay people as an additional way to pay people. It's called tipping. So if you like a website and you want to pay more than the, the, the rate that streaming, you actually have a tip button. Actually, maybe I can show you this. Let me, st Let me try to bring out the... Uh, Um, wrong. Let me try to bring a new window up. Okay, so the way this works is, for example, my website is web monetized. And I have this little web monetization extension installed. And you can see it's just sitting there. But as soon as my websites load, Right. As soon as my website's lo website load, this indicator button becomes green and it says, you are paying, oh wow, oh wow, this looks very, very bad. I wonder what happened with my CSS. Okay, so this green indicator um, starts there and that means I'm paying myself right now. And this, if you, if you open it up, it actually says your coil membership streams payment to this site while you're on it. They are trialing a new feature as part of their, they're a web monetization provider, right? They are here so that you don't have to build all of this if you want to pay websites. So they're actually working on a new feature called tipping. The coupon code I'm gonna give you on, on Twitter, if you reach out, actually enables this feature for you and gives you, I think it gives you $10 in tips. So it gives you $10 of free money if you want to, every month, if you want to say thank you to people around the world. I feel like they've done that as a way to show that appreciation um, for the people who have to suffer through my talk. 
Um, I'm not affiliated with Coil in any way. I think it's just their way of being nice. But they enable this tipping feature um, for the people who get my coupon code. If you sign up through their website, they actually don't have the tipping feature live yet. It's beta, but you can you can choose to pay a website on top of that. I'm gonna so while doing while doing this, I'm just gonna pay myself a dollar because I feel bad about about sending more. But I can I can tip website as well, so I can choose to pay more than the um, than the, the the streaming if I want to. If I don't want to, that's a different that's a different thing. And me, as a, as a website owner, I have absolutely nothing but the meta tag. And I feel like that's where the, um, that's where the JavaScript API comes in because you can see all these events of Alex started streaming money on your website. Alex paid you a dollar, right? And you can display messages. You can say, thank you. You can give them access to more content. Me being lazy, I just put the meta tag in. So the people who, pay me by streaming, I'm happy with just that. I don't want to gate content or anything like that. Did that answer your question, Guillermo? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have a lot of more doubts, uh, more <laughs> questions, but yes, that answered my question, my initial question. <laughs> well, feel free to have more questions. I feel like we've got, I don't know, maybe five more minutes, Darren, of this. So if you have more questions, um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I don't have any more questions in the chat. So if you have more questions, Guillermo, feel free to ask. No, uh, the, the other part, I think that is that is more uh, intellectual than than the, the the standard, right? Uh, it's how, uh, and it's supposed that it's part of the wallet, but uh, how do I put my bank account in the, in the wallet? What how okay. how that okay, money okay. came to me in or into the website so that depends on who your wallet with with who your wallet is right ideally in an ideal world we'd get a bank on the network and then you would have your bank account directly tied into a payment pointer right it wouldn't be a wallet where you have the wallet that's connected to your bank account you have the bank account connected directly um, in terms of who your wallet is different wallets do it differently so for example my wallet is uphold uh, so my wallet is uphold and I have, so this is how much I've made with web monetization. In the, I'm sorry, in the past year. And you can probably see when I, this is around, around the time MozFest happened. And I got a lot of tips from MozFest in the MozFest experiment. Uh, but the, uh, like this uh, lives with my wallet. And if I want to take out money, I think I need to, Somewhere in here, yeah, I can I can put it out in the bank account. I think one of the the my favorite features of weaponization is it doesn't really care what uh, it doesn't really care what currency the payment provider sends because the payment provider sends dollars, for example. I receive them in pounds because this is what I want to receive, and that's the feature of the uh, that's a feature of the IntelliJ network. It takes a it takes a transfer and says, we can actually make transfer from one currency to the other. We'll find a different node in the network to do this currency conversion bit and we'll convert it for you automatically. And that's, that's how Coil, for example, pays dollars and I get pounds. Okay, I feel like the, uh, the whole chat has been really quiet. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Guillermo, for the wonderful questions. In the meantime, after this, if you've seen the recording and you still want the uh, you still want the coupon code, please reach out on Twitter. I'm always available. I'm always available on Twitter. Reach out on Twitter and I'll share I'll share coupon codes. I've got a few to go around. I've probably got uh, about maybe 50 codes left. So feel free to reach out even in the in the future. If I run out of codes, I'm always gonna go ask for more uh, and hope we'll we'll get some to share around. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you for the questions. Uh, thank you, Code Mentor, for hosting me today. And hopefully everybody had a, a really good time. And I'll hope to see you again in the future.